The Witch of Blackbird Pond Chapter 8 The onion field in the South Meadow needs weeding, announced Matthew one morning in early June. If Judith and Catherine can be spared, they can spend the morning at it. The two girls who set out soon after breakfast did not provide such a contrast as on meeting day. Scandalized to see Kit wearing out her finery with scrubbing and cooking, Rachel and Mercy had made her a calico dress, exactly the same as Judith's. It was coarse woven and simply made, without so much as a single bow for trimming, but it was certainly far more suited to the menial work she had to do in it. Beyond a doubt, too, it had made for an easier relationship with her cousin. This morning, Judith seemed almost friendly. What a wonderful day, she exclaimed. Aren't you glad we don't have to stay inside, Kit? Kit felt quite cheerful. It really was a wonderful day, with a bright blue sky and the fields and woods all soft green. The roadway was bordered with daisies and buttercups, pale and thin, of course, compared to the brilliant masses of color in Barbados, but pretty all the same. And for the first time since she had come to Weathersfield, she did not feel chilly. The girls passed the meeting house, turned down Short Street, and went on down the pathway that was known as the South Road. The Great Meadow, Judith explained, was the grassy land that lay within the wide loop of the river. No one lives there, Judith told her, because in the spring the river floods over and sometimes the fields are completely covered. After the water goes down, we can use the land. Tis good, rich soil, and every landowner has a lot for pasture or gardens. Father is entitled to a bigger lot, but he has no one to help him. As they came out from the shelter of the trees and the great meadow stretched before them, Kit caught her breath. She had not expected anything like this. From that first moment, in a way she could never explain, the meadows claimed her and made her their own. As far as she could see, they stretched on either side a great level sea of green, broken here and there by a solitary graceful elm. Was it the fields of sugarcane they brought to mind, or the endless reach of the ocean to meet the sky? Or was it simply the sense of freedom and space and light that spoke to her of home. If only I could be here alone without Judith or anyone, she thought with longing. Someday I'm going to come back to this place when there is time, just to stand still and look at it. How often she would come back she had no way of foreseeing, nor could she know that never in the months to come would the meadows break the promise they held for her at this moment, a promise of peace and quietness and of comfort for a troubled heart? What are you looking at, demanded Judith, turning back impatiently. Father's field is farther on. I was wondering about that little house, said Kit, by way of excuse. I thought you said no one lived down here. Far over to the right, at the edge of the marshy pond, a wisp of smoke curled gently from a lopsided chimney. Beyond the little shack, something moved. Was it a shadow or a slight stooped figure? Oh, that's Widow Tooper. Judith's voice was edged with contempt. Nobody but Hannah Tooper would live there by Blackbird Pond, right at the edge of the swamp. But she likes it. They can't persuade her to leave. What if the river floods? It did four years ago, and her house was covered right over. No one knows where she hid, but when the water went down, there she was again. She cleaned out the mud and went right on as though nothing had happened. She's been there as long as I can remember. All alone? With her cats. There's always a cat or so around. People say she's a witch. Do you believe in witches, Judith? Maybe not, said Judith doubtfully. All the same, 
It gives me a creepy feeling to look at her. She's queer, that's certain. And she never comes to meeting. I'd just rather not get any closer. Kit looked back at the gray figure bent over a kettle, stirring something with a long stick. Her spine prickled. It might be only soap, of course. She'd stirred a kettle herself just yesterday. Goodness knows her arms still ached from it. But that lonely figure in the ragged, flapping shawl. It was easy enough to imagine any sort of mysterious brew in that pot. She quickened her step to catch up with Judith. The long rows of onions looked endless, their sharp green shoots already half hidden by encroaching weeds. Judith plumped matter-of-factly to her knees and began to pull vigorously. Kit could never get over her amazement at her cousin. Judith, so proud and uppity, so vain of the curls that fell just so on her shoulder, so finicky about the snowy linen collar that was the only vanity allowed her, kneeling in the dirt, doing work that a high-class slave in Barbados would rebel at. What a strange country this was. Well, what are you standing for? Judith demanded. Father says we have to do three rows before we can go home for dinner. Kit lowered herself gingerly and gathered a half-hearted handful. At the second tug, an onion shoot came too, and glancing to see if Judith had noticed, she guiltily thrust the tiny root back into the earth and patted it firm. Bother the things. She would have to keep her mind on them. All at once, tears of self-pity brimmed in her eyes. What was she doing here anyway? Sir Francis Tyler's granddaughter, squatting in an onion patch. She jerked at the weeds. If she should marry William Ashby, would he expect her to weed his vegetables for him? Her hand stopped moving at all while she considered this. No, she was quite certain he never would. Did it seem likely that his mother, who sat so elegantly in meeting, had ever touched a chokeweed? There were no blisters under those soft gloves, Kit wagered. She knew by now that the humble folk who sat in the very back of the meeting house were servants of the fine families of Withersfield. William would own servants himself beyond a doubt. She wiped a grimy hand across her eyes. Perhaps she could endure this work for a time if the future offered an escape. A more immediate escape offered itself that very noontime. The two girls returned home to find Mercy brimming with excitement, her gray eyes sparkling. The most wonderful thing, Kit. Dr. Bulkley has recommended to the selectmen that you help me with the school this summer. A school? echoed Kit. Do you teach a school, Mercy? Just the dame school for the young children in the summer months. With you to help me, I can take more pupils. What do you teach them? Their letters and to read and write their names. They can't go to the grammar school, you know, till they can read, and many of their parents can't teach them. Where is the school? Right here in the kitchen. I don't know much about children, said Kit dubiously. You know how to read, don't you? John Holbrook told Dr. Bulkley that you can read as well as he can. Kit started. Had John repeated to Dr. Bulkley that conversation on the dolphin? Likely not, or he would never have recommended her. She had never dared to mention books in this household, where there was no book at all except the Holy Bible. Yes, of course I can read, she admitted cautiously. Well, they are going to send Mr. Eliezer Kimberly, the schoolmaster, to test you. Then the school will begin next week. Father is pleased too, Kit. We'll both be earning wages. Real wages? Every child pays a four pence a week. Sometimes they pay with eggs or wool or such things instead. It will help Kit a great deal. The more she thought about it, the more pleasant the dame school sounded to Kit. 
Surely, if she were earning wages, they would no longer expect her to scrub floors and weed the onions. Even more, a feeling of satisfaction, even of triumph, began to grow in her mind. Later that day, as she sat alone with Mercy over their wool combs, she spoke her thoughts aloud. If I am earning wages, she said suddenly, then perhaps you will all think I am of some use, even if I'm not a boy. She could not keep out of her voice the bitterness that had rankled all these weeks. Mercy laid down her carding and stared at her cousin. What do you mean, Kit? That first night I was here, confessed Kit. Judas said, if only I had been a boy. Oh, Kit. Tears suddenly flooded Mercy's eyes. You heard that. Why didn't you tell me before? Kit looked down in embarrassment. She wished now that she'd held her tongue. She didn't mean what you think, Kit. It's just that father needs a boy so much to help. Mercy hesitated. Mother has never told you much about our family, has she? She went on. You see, there was a boy, their first child, two years older than I. I barely remember him. We both caught some kind of fever. I got well except for this leg, but he died. I didn't know, whispered Kit, stricken. Poor Aunt Rachel. There was another boy after Judith, Mercy continued. He lived only a week. Mother said it was the will of God, but sometimes I have wondered. He was very tiny, born early, but on the third day he had to be baptized. It was January and terribly cold. They said the bread froze on the plates at communion that Sunday. Father bundled him up and carried him to the meeting house. He was so proud. Well, of course, that was a long time ago. But after that, Father changed. And it has been a struggle, trying to manage without a son to help. That's all we meant, Kit. Kit sat silence, her own bitterness forgotten. I will try harder to understand, she vowed. But oh, poor Aunt Rachel, who had been always laughing. And we'll stop here and continue with Chapter 9 in the next video. Till then, as Tigger says, ta-ta for now. Thanks so much for watching. I love you guys. Bye-bye.